Hi everyone, here's the Bookchemist once again, and a couple of weeks back I reviewed Utopia Avenue by David Mitchell, a book that I disliked immensely. It was the first time in forever that I filmed a negative review, and that got me thinking, because as I mentioned extensively in my review, David Mitchell is otherwise an author I adore. Cloud Atlas and Number Nine Dream are among the best novels, the most stimulating and inventive and, and wondrous novels I've read in recent years, and I was so disappointed with that one, that got me thinking about other books from authors I love that I just couldn't stomach. And that sounded like a really interesting idea to talk about with you guys, and even more than in my other videos, in this one I really want to hear your opinion, I want to hear about certain novels, short story collections, poetry collections by authors you otherwise love that you just couldn't stand, or that at least you couldn't connect very, very effectively with. Before I begin, this video, I should mention, is sponsored by Skillshare, an online community of creators, experts in various fields, from home uh, finance to creative writing to design, illustration, all sorts of classes are offered on Skillshare, which is a website with an awesome community feeling. I'll talk about it more at the end of the video, but you should know that there's a link in the description box that will give the first first thousand people to click on it, a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. Once more I want to reiterate that the purpose of this video is not at all to provide simply a list of bad books. I firmly believe that even books we dislike, even books we can't connect with, should still, generally speaking, be treated with respect, because very, very likely these are still books that cost their authors a huge investment in terms of mental space, in, in terms of sheer time, and in terms of work, hard labor. S some author might have spent five, ten years on a book that then you pick off the shelf and you, I don't know, mark with one star on Goodreads. And that's fair, it's part of the game. Sometimes you're appreciated, sometimes you're not. But I still believe that when a book is written with passion, you are always able to get something out of it, even if you maybe dislike the way it's narrated, the, um, the, the bifurcations of its plot, whatever feature of the book. Written with passion doesn't necessarily mean it has to be some kind of fantasy epic or an indignant opera a la Grapes of Wrath. Uh, a book that is very subdued and very sad can be written with a passion that's, in, that's, that's sustained by pain and, and suffering. A dystopian novel or a book about a dysfunctional family may still be written with a passion that's rich in archness and in a wish to point out the failures and the pettiness of human beings. Even in the most formulaic and serialized fiction, passion can still shine through. The author's enjoyment of the world they are creating, their ease with their craft, this sense that they were having fun or at least that this story they are creating deserves to be shared. But moving to the whole point of the video, the author I discuss possibly the most on my channel, the one I mention most frequently as my favorite, asterisk, is H.P. Lovecraft. And H.P. Lovecraft is a difficult author to have as your favorite. I believe that I remarked in the past on the fact that, in my opinion, Lovecraft never wrote a perfect short story. I think he went very close to it in, say, The Call of Cthulhu, The Rats in the Walls, The Quest of Iranon, The Doom That Came to Sarneth, but he always had to go overboard with a sentence that was just overwrought, or the philosophical point he was trying to make intrudes too clumsily into the flow of the narrative at the wrong time. At the same time, I do believe that he is one of the greats, and that he wrote a whole canon of incredible narrative achievements, incredible stories, but he also wrote a fair share of stories that just fall short of the mark, that are maybe motivated and propelled by interesting ideas and interesting uh, interesting plotting, uh, uh, some interesting development for a character, but they just don't go far enough. A good example of this would be the festival, which is an attempt to portray a story through the perspective of somebody whose perception of the events is later questioned, very basic, fantastic, 
narrative. The story is compelling in its setting. There, when when the supernatural intrudes in the narrative, it as the whole story escalates very fast, in a very uh, strong and impactful manner. But at the end of the day, it's I still feel with the festival and so many other of Lovecraft stories, like there's something missing. It feels more like the draft of a more developed story than the thing itself. And for the love of God, as much as he wrote these minor achievements, Lovecraft wrote a lot of bad stories and he wrote a lot of truly awful ones. The street obviously takes the cake. Speaking of my favorite authors, the ones that don't really belong in this video are Thomas Pynchon and Jonathan Lethem. Vineland and the Crying of Lot 49 uh, did not really convince me the way the other Pension novels did, but number one, they are both due a rereading, and number two, the, even The Crying of Lot 49 is so genius on a sentence by sentence basis that it makes no sense for me to think about it as in any way a bad novel, even though it might be my least favorite among the Pension novels. R really, are we ever going to talk about Crying of Lot 49 as a in negative terms, does that even make sense? It's the crying of Lot 49, for crying out loud. Similarly with Jonathan Lethem, even the novels that convince me the least, I still consider really truly good books. Amnesia Moon might be the, the, the last, uh, the, my least favorite among the Lethem novels, but even this one features a couple of truly unforgettable scenes and passages that I rank among the most imaginative science fiction I've ever read. With Lethem, I think maybe some of the short stories didn't really convince me, they, they really weren't for me. Something happens there, which also happens incidentally in Lethem's nonfiction, which is that at certain points the writing just gets a little bit too cerebral and opaque and it, it loses me. It, it, it just loses me. Manhattan Beach by Jennifer Egan is probably the closest example I can think of an experience that's similar to what I had with Utopia Avenue. What I experienced with this book, which was enjoyable, flowed very nicely, it's engaging, you care about the protagonist, you want to see how her life develops. I just felt like it lacked the genius of her other books. In all those other novels, there was always something truly interesting going on at the level of language, at the level of the, the broader structure of the plot, how the narrative was being organized. It was always so very stimulating to your imagination, to your engagement with the book. Nothing of the sort, I felt, was really going on in Manhattan Beach. And it's not even a matter that this is a simpler and more enjoyable book, because in all honesty, I feel like all of the others, except maybe Invisible Circus, are even more enjoyable and more engaging and possibly even easier reads, even though they have so much more to unpack and can get you can get so much more out of those, out of the keep, look at me, a visit from the goon squad, if you just put in the investment in terms of effort. Uh, full disclaimer, uh, Manhattan Beach is still an immensely better novel than Utopia Avenue. With Michael Chabon, another one of my very, very favorite authors, I feel like he's also written his share of books that maybe miss the mark of what I thought the novel was trying to achieve. Summerland uh, and Telegraph Avenue suffer from that a little bit, but with both of these books, even just because of the way they're written, because of Chabon's amazingly baroque and lush narrative style, I still count these books among my favorite all the same. And there's so much, so much enjoyment and so much so much intellectual stimulation to be had from those novels. The ones I would probably count as my least favorite are Gentlemen of the Road and The Final Solution. Gentlemen of the Road is written in imitation of adventure stories from the 19th century, uh, such as the works of Jules Verne, for instance. It does with its uh, genre a little bit of what Mason and Dixon does with the 18th century novel. I liked the idea, in, in all honesty, I liked the execution, I liked the wonderful illustrations, and yet it still fell short. Uh, a bit like with Lovecraft's festival, it felt like it didn't convey the full potential of what the narrative, what the, the character significance, of what all that 
was aiming toward. The final solution intertextualizes, uh, plays a lot with the Sherlock Holmes canon, and I am not yet a Sherlock Holmes fan. I only read the first two Sherlock Holmes novels like 10 years ago or something and wasn't really convinced by them, but I fully intend to reread Final Solution once I've read the other Sherlock Holmes novels and the, uh, the short stories and hopefully become a fan myself. And just to give you an idea of how fluid all of these things I'm talking about are, if I'd filmed this video four or five years ago, I probably would have mentioned The uh, Mysteries of Pittsburgh as my least favorite Chaban novel, whereas after rereading it, uh, I at least fully realized the genius and the richness of his narrative style. And when you think how, about how young he was when he, when he wrote it, well, I, I just think that that novel might be less ambitious than his other works, but considering what it's trying to achieve, it is a, it is a small masterpiece, really. Moving back to my native country, The Non-Existent Night by Calvino has nothing on the first two volumes in the Ancestors trilogy. It, 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 funnily enough and ironically, it exists, and that's most I can say about the book. It's there, it's short, you've read the first two, why wouldn't you read the third? Um, earlier this year I really struggled with uh, Storia di chi fugge di chi resta, Those Who Leave and Those Who Stay, I think is the English title, the third volume in Elena Ferrante's Neapolitan novels, which truly put me off the whole series for a little bit, because the focus of the series shifts a little bit, it's difficult to assess what happens there. In a way, the series abandon some traits, generic ones in terms of elements of magical realism, uh, thematic ones in terms of its concern with the life of the uh, poor neighborhood in which the protagonists were, were born. Uh, many of these things are abandoned either entirely or almost entirely in the third volume, which becomes a little bit of a dysfunctional family drama of the very straight-up literary kind that tends to bore me easily. Whatever happened, I really struggle with this one, even though I adored the rest of the series. Oh, and speaking of truly, absolutely, really irredeemably bad, Only Revolution and the Fifty Year Sword by Mark Danielewski and The New Life by Oren Pamuk. No. It's one person's opinion, it's just mine, but I don't think they should have seen the light of publication in the first place. This week I had great fun talking about this topic with my patrons, the people who support the channel on patreon.com. Alan Tobin mentioned The Childhood of Jesus by J.M. Coetzee um, as a book that really didn't convince him, even though he, is a, he was a great fan of Disgrace. I, I really appreciated Disgrace a few years back myself, and I've been meaning to read more Coetzee for a long time, so I'll, I'll keep that in mind as I approach my next book in his over. Jacob Johnson mentioned The City We Became by N.K. Jasmine. Uh, the Broken Earth trilogy by Jasmine has been at the top of my list for so long, and I really hope I'll be able to read at least the first volume in 2021, and if I do read the Broken Earth trilogy, I might very well check out The City We Became, just to see what the deal is with it, because Jacob's opinion was so very strong. As Spencer Solheim mentioned High Rise by Ballard. Ballard will definitely be in my list for 2021. I was thinking of either Crash or Atrocity Exhibition. John Joyce mentioned Gentlemen of the Road, as I did in my video, totally agree. And Sven Clays, Clays I hope, uh, mentioned Dog Years by Gunther Grass. And again, The Tin Drum has been on my list for a very long time. All of these books I'm hoping to read 2021, that's probably quite ambitious, but it was very interesting for me to read how many of us have these authors that we venerate and we adore so much and that maybe for that very reason disappoint us especially hard when we find a book of theirs that we just can't connect with. But that's it. I really look forward to reading what books you disliked from authors who otherwise you adored. I really look forward to reading how you coped with it. Did you just excuse it as a momentary glitch? Did it change the way you assessed these writers? Definitely Only Revolution and Fifty Years Sword, and in, to, a, to a lesser extent The Familiar, changed the way I looked at Mark Danielewski as an author. Maybe cured me a little bit of a, a fascination I had with this quirky, unconventional narrative techniques. Uh, in general, because I tend to think of authors' books 
in terms of over uh, and poetics. Uh, I tend to see authors, um, the books by a single author, as connected as all part of a broader discussion, which is inserted within the even larger discussion of literature. Usually a bad book, I, I, I struggle to consider a bad or a, a book that dissatisfied me as an isolated case. It tends to shift the way I read the rest a little bit, but maybe I'm odd and wrong. <laughs> and How do you read these sorts of books, these sorts of narratives? I really look forward to discussing that. Thank you, as always, for watching the video, and thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring it. As I was saying, the community feeling on Skillshare, this website offering video classes on a broad array of topics, is one of the things I like the most. You get to see how other people who are taking this class are coping with the assignments. You get to share your experience and your output with people who are as passionate as you on whatever it is that the class focuses. It's a very relaxing, very friendly, very constructive constructive environment. One class I enjoyed recently, just to give you a sense that you don't really need to be thinking about a career in design to enjoy the classes on offer on Skillshare, was a class by Plated about how to prepare the perfect grilled cheese sandwich, which is something that's quite basic and yet difficult to get to, to, to achieve to perfection. Very often you get semi-cold, somewhat cloying results, and and with just a few tips, just a few suggestions, this class changed the way I approached the grilled cheese sandwich. And tell me if that isn't worth uh, an hour of your time. Much less, actually. I think that was a much shorter class. And also, with all of these classes, because they are split in different lessons, you can, t you can take them at whatever pace is more appropriate to you. You can just sit down one afternoon and enjoy an entire class, or maybe you can watch a few snippets here and there, take one micro lesson at a time. It's really, it's developed so that it fits around your needs. I definitely recommend you check out that link in the description box to the free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. And uh, regardless of that, uh, Skillshare is actually really cheap. A yearly subscription is less than $10 a month. Once more, thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring the video and to you for watching it. And I look forward to discussing bad books in the comment section. Bye, people.